Welcome to Legends of Weed. My name is Joanne Sukumaran. Every episode, I interview a top wind player from the bassoon or oboe community. Find out more about them, about their musical knowledge and insights, and what makes them tick. Stay tuned. So, hello everyone and welcome to episode 2 of Legends of Weed. Today I have a very distinguished guest, uh, Ulla Christian Dao, who is professor in Bassoon in Music Hochschule Mantai. Um, he is the guest principal in famous orchestras and ensembles. So uh, I'd just like to let you know that I'm actually on location in Ubud in Bali. We just had a very long day of uh, photo shoots, so I hope I don't sound delirious because I've been on the bicycle and the motorbike and we've been shooting in the jungles and the paddy fields. But very warm welcome to Ula. How are you today? Thank you very much, Joanne. Yeah. Very nice yeah. to meet you. And uh, yeah, your day in Bali is uh, certainly more exciting than my day teaching in the Hochschule, but uh, no, it's very nice to see the students again. Of course, long day of teaching also, but uh, less palms and no fancy drinks so far. <laughs> So what have you been up to uh, recently? I've read that you've been uh, giving master classes uh, in Lyon and uh, Brussels. Is that right? That's true. I had a very nice um, invitation from Luc Le Brut, who was the bassoon teacher in Brussels. And he's actually retiring uh, this year. And he asked his students whom they would like to invite for a master class. And he was kind enough to finance this himself and make it a as a goodbye present for the students, which I thought was very nice. Um, and of course, you can't say no to that. Uh, I tried to arrange it, and we had a very nice time in Brussels. I said, I'd love to come and teach your students, uh, but on one condition, um, that I can take you out for dinner at your favorite restaurant in Brussels. Because uh, I actually had never met Luc Lulu before. So it was a, a very special occasion. We had a wonderful meal, fantastic talk. He's an amazing guy with a long, long career. And um, so, uh, yeah, that was uh, two great days in Brussels. Then I went to Lyon afterwards to teach the great class in Lyon for my very good friend Carlo Colombo. And yeah, I had quite a bit of good food there too, <laughs> surprisingly enough. But it was very refreshing times. Um, it's also a special bond to Carlo Colombo and Lyon because he also studied with Roger Bersting, uh, my old teacher from Geneva. So we have a yeah, we have a lot of links, a lot of common things we teach, actually. Yeah, I, I understand from our last conversation that you actually like to uh, eat, right? So what's your favorite food? Do you have one, Una? Well, to be very honest, my absolute favorite food is foie gras, actually. And uh, I mean, one really shouldn't eat that too often, and it, it's made in the most horrid way. But I don't know, that uh, hits my soft spot very much. So if I can have a foie gras and a glass of uh, Sauterne, this kind of sweet wine, I um, yeah, doesn't get any better. Okay, but you, you don't eat any seafood, right? Is that right? Yeah, that's the pathetic part of being in a region that doesn't eat the seafood. It's like a Dutch person that doesn't eat cheese, isn't it? So it's, um, no, embarrassingly enough, I don't eat seafood. I'm trying to grow up. Uh, and I can slowly eat a little bit of tuna, maybe a little bit of cod, but any kind of shellfish or crabs or prawns. Yeah. Uh, okay. That's a bit... Oh, that's a pity, but maybe we can uh, convince you to come to the dark side of the food spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I know that you're a huge Star Wars fan, right? Um, can you explain your fascination with Star Wars? Did you watch the, the latest release, uh, you know, the Han Solo one? No, that's actually a very bitter thing because I was teaching all day instead of being oh. in the movies. Germany, okay. they also have uh, Star Wars in German. And I don't know if Ich heiße Han Solo is uh, too exciting. I'd, I'd prefer to see it in English, really. But no, the fascination came very early. I mean, it was uh, absolutely mind-opening. Uh, thing with these movies, with this whole sci-fi stuff. So when you're a little kid, then yeah, this thing hit the screen. And I, of course, I love the the whole balance of the, you know the masters, the Jedi's, the, the school, the discipline, the Padawans, the whole thing. And I mean, if you transfer that into teaching, there's so many similarities. Uh, 
not, not necessarily the good and the evil part of it, but um, there's a lot of respect that how you pass on knowledge and stuff like that. And I remember very well also my time with Bursting. Uh, a very Yoda-esque experience, although uh, Roger is slightly more fit than uh, Yoda, absolutely. Um, and uh, it was a very special time for me. I mean, he was already up in his years, but uh, incredibly clear head with an amazing amount of uh, experience. And he was kind enough to share this. And uh, it was a very important time for me. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really lovely to hear because I think um, I felt very inspired by your master classes and by your book uh, drills, right? I think it has been one of your trademarks and you, you've been known as like the Yoda, right? In the bassoon uh, <laughs> circle, right? Uh, and, um, and you call your students uh, Padawans and... Uh, and but uh, why did you publish drills? Why not keep it a secret? You know? That's my question. I, I was curious about that. Yeah. No, actually, a lot of people have asked me, why, why do you want to share this? And uh, yeah, why not? I mean, I think that's a very modern thing to do these days. Um, we do have a lot of knowledge that has come up in later years, and uh, the will and the need to, to share it, I think, is very different. I mean, in the old days, if you belonged to a school, you had like uh, your armor and your, your flag, and you only belonged to the school, and if you took a lesson with somebody else, you would get in terrible trouble. And I think today, I mean, the market is so difficult that we are uh, actually sharing a lot more. We're also doing exchanges as teachers in other schools. Um, and we just have to be very happy if everybody gets a job in place. So uh, with drills, um, it was a gathering process because I had a lot of exercise and I had a lot of information um, that needed to be organized. And I, I had a lot of these exercises that I did myself because I, I didn't really find them in my studies and I wanted these kind of tools. Um, and I was an orchestral player at that time. I wanted to stay in shape and get better. So uh, I had the chance to sort of teach myself a little bit in the beginning. But I had to start because, well, it was kind of far to go to Dark, to Hanover. It wasn't really around the corner. Um, so I was teaching myself a bit. And then when I came to Danish Radio, I had this great guys, both Odin and Fredrik, Odin uh, Harvost and Fredrik Ekdal, taking lessons. And I had the chance to try all these things out on these rather uh, talented test bunnies, if we can call them that. Even. So, I mean, in that sense, I got a lot of confidence saying, okay, this seems to work actually, so maybe I can try and organize it and uh, put it into a system. And Caitlin was, Caitlin Cameron is an incredibly organized person and she really made this system, uh, you know, work in the sense that it was uh, understandable for people to take it, that it wasn't too overwhelming and that it had like a natural pro uh, progress and process. So it was a very um, good thing to do and the system is used and it works and yeah, I'm very pleased um, that we made this book and now we're planning uh, Drills 2.0 with a lot of new things also. So that's exciting. Ah, so will it be published soon, Drills 2.0? Not soon, but soonish. Um, things take time, and since um, drills, the first book is very much to the point and sort of quite, to, uh, how to say, like a bouillon or a consommé. It's reduced, and people need to, to really think what's written. And so I, we don't want to, you know, do something too fast and too hasty with number two. But I can tell you a few of the things that will be in that book will be there will be a whole chapter about how to achieve form, how to build for Stefana in this, just like more or less like an athlete uh, in that sense. Um, there will also be a big chapter about fingerings, how to use fingerings for different things and to standardize your fingerings. And there will be a lot of very nice tricks for the suits. Uh, we have collected quite a few things, a lot from my experience, but also a little bit from Carlo uh, Colombo also. And so we have some incredibly nice nice fake fingerings for soft playing, for high playing, all these kind of things. So, and there will actually be a big chapter called Behavior in Orchestra, which is of course an incredibly dangerous topic and I'm sure I will be getting a lot of pepper for that, but somebody has to do it. So I, I, I find it very important to try and inform students who are going into trials and, you know, about the landmines. Yeah, so you were talking about the landmines, you know, in the industry, like, you know, um, in this recent year, we had so much um, 
debate and the heated uh, discussions, you know, about the women's rights, you know, the Me Too movement. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, and then I feel as a female artist and, and being independent, that somehow, yeah, you know, sometimes I have to deal with a lot of agents. And sometimes the agents are rather dodgy. Do you have some advice for this kind of situation? Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, I have to say I, I'm very happy that this whole issue business actually has come up and actually created a new level of understanding that one says, well, you know, it's not okay to be dodgy, absolutely not. And I mean, uh, not in any sense. And that's uh, especially also for us teachers. We are so in such close proximity with the students also. And I mean, for me personally, I find it very important to have the classes open. All my, all my classes are open so people can listen and stuff like that. I think that's absolutely natural. So what I would do in, in your case is I would surf a little bit of this wave and you know, let this motion for me to strengthen your back, actually to say, well, that's not okay and stuff like this. And uh, you know, rather say no to something that uh, is a little dodgy instead of thinking, well, that would be a nice uh, gig or something like that, I just have to you know, cope with this uh, slimy person or something. And that's, I wouldn't do that. I mean, one has one has enough understanding for the whole situation now, I think. Yeah, I think it's pretty clear, no? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Since our last conversation, I was thinking a lot about our, our um, performance as very, being very similar to an athlete. So do you have any... Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any pre-performance routine? Like, what goes on in your head before you go on stage, you know? Like, what do you think in your head? Oh, there are many things. Yeah, but that's, it's a, I think it's very individual for many people. But I mean, I think what, what I typically do is to actually brush the dust of all the particular things I need from an academic point of view. You check your breathing, you check your pressure, you check your tongue, you do all these things. But um, that's just like brushing off the tools and, and getting ready. But more importantly, you try to sort of live yourself into the music. Even though if it's not your cup of tea of music, that you really try to go into that world and make it as genuine and real as possible. It's our obligation. It's also what we do for a living. And um, I think it's very important to try and dive into the, into the heat of the composer and what they went through when they wrote this kind of music. I mean, just a few days ago, we played Bruckner 7. We have hardly anything to play, but it's beautiful music. And you have to dive into it and be part of that ride, what the concert can be. So I think that's a, just a very strong devotion to music in general that I want to do. When you want to serve the composer, or serve the set deck, or serve the orchestra, or the chamber and sound, or I think that's a very good approach. There is no such thing as bad music in the sense when we're performing. Yeah, definitely the, the idea of uh, being of service you know, to the composer or to the audience helps take mm. the pressure off the situation, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think uh, that was a very clear thing from the Times in Cologne Radio, 13 years of live playing on radio. Sure, there's a, always an element of, of perfection that you are supposed to achieve, but it's also very dangerous to let uh, the need of perfection take away your creativity saying, okay, I'm going to play this with a safety net. Uh, one cannot do that, at least not all your life. Uh, I don't think it's a very healthy thing to do. But we must not forget how, how the expectations are today, also from auditions, how flawless we are expecting people to play, how, how perfect things has to be. So finding that balance is uh, very, very crucial. And that's why we also wrote very specifically about this in drill CS. You study extremely strong academics in one part of the exercises, then you have a bridge model where you walk between the academics and creativity. And then the third part is to be as free and creative as possible. And without this third part, you don't have the first part and vice versa. So having, um, being, um, and the drills is a means to the end, no? It's not the be all, right? That, that's what you mean, right? Exactly. I mean, it's, uh, it's a way to, I mean, it's, it's the house of the Grundbau of the house. So <coughs> you have to take care of your, your house and especially the fundament. And that's, it's a fundament a building technique. Um, and that's what I find quite fascinating. I mean, you actually know quite a few of my older students. And I think we can both say with a hand on our hearts that they sound very different. Uh, 
for the L dinner club, like it's best of all these people. Uh, but the interesting thing part is that the fundament is actually the same, but it is it gives the ability to play the bassoon in a certain way, or a certain capacity, but then you can build the house after your desire. I think that's exactly what I'm supposed to teach. I'm supposed to teach people how to do it, but uh, you know how to achieve these things, and how to achieve this kind of control, and then comes the, the creative process. Yes, I might help a bit uh, to, to lead the way or to give some uh, advice and stuff like that, but in the end, the person has to develop their own signature. So I think that's what I'm doing. I'm learning, you know, trying to show people uh, with which pencil they can write with their individual handwriting. They have to do it themselves. Okay, so empowering uh, students with the right tool, right? So they can go in the direction that they want to, you know? Exactly, right? Yeah. So, do you have any tips, like, um, for example, like you perform yeah, not so ideally in a competition or an audition, how would you tell someone to recover quickly from a setback or from a mistake? Is there like a pep, pep talk or something? Or? We very often talk about, uh, you know, if you, if you fall off the horse, uh, the first thing you have to do is to climb on top of it. Yeah, I mean, if, you, if, you, if you fall on your skis, uh, do it again right away. I mean, and it's very natural uh, to, you know, have setbacks and stuff like this. Um, so, I mean, one has to see the bigger picture here. I mean, it could be a step to the side, uh, and actually some of my absolute best students have developed the most after a setback. It's not about how you fall, it's about how you stand up again. So, I mean, that's an incredibly crucial part of, of studies. Actually, falling flat on your face, experiencing that, and actually learning from the process. Uh, you know, it's what good old Nelson Mandela said, sitting, I mean, God knows how many decades in prison. He said, I always learn something, I either win or I uh, learn something. I never lose. Mm. What, a, what an amazing attitude to have, you know, when you sit in like three quarters of your life in prison. Yeah, not being uh, resentful about it, I think, no? Or bitter, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, yeah, I mean, we all know what difficult things can be audition wise, and there can be politics, there can be all kinds of stuff. But very often I teach the students, or I, I want them to, to, if you were happy with what you were doing, then we've come a long, time, a long way. Results will come, uh, you know, we have to find the right way and also that's a big part of my job as a teacher. Not only trying to just make people as good as possible, but actually trying to find where could this person thrive and blossom and actually have a great life. You know, that's it's not only about playing the pursuit, it's actually making this your living and uh, making it your life. There are many more many more factors than playing high season too, than just that. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I, I think uh, I've been uh, experimenting a bit to be more creative in practicing. So trying mm -hmm. to let go and doing improvisation, that has helped me a lot to find the uh, um, spark back in practicing, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, so do you think, uh, what do you think has been the most valuable thing you have learned in your career? The most important thing I've learned in my career is definitely uh, that one has to treat music with respect and love. There is no other way to it. Um, and fortunately, I, I, I do love music. I love any kind of music. I really do. But I think that's, um, like I said a bit, if you, if you play a concert or something, diving into that world, into that setting, into that galaxy, or whatever the star system may be, that's the obligation we have as musicians. Let's go to the core and find out what, you know, what is it that Bruckner wants? What is it that Bach wants, you know, this particular setting? And that's the big thing you can learn, I think, also. So there is uh, amazing amounts of music out there and you can learn so much from so many different people. And that's, um, and it, you know, not all of them are perfect musicians at all. I mean, there are perfect instrumentalists, or not at all, but you learn. Dive into their world and pick up all the stuff that you can. So it's a uh, never ending study trip, studying or playing the musician. You should yeah. never go on the empty part of the tank, you can always refill it. But not only with the, uh, you know, your classical petroleum, but also jazz and everything else that you know, would actually expand your horizon, just like you said. 
how you improvise things, how you do things to you know, expand your horizon, find other parts of your playing. Totally important. So, Ulla, then, uh, do you enjoy listening to other genres? Do you have any guilty pleasures? Or do you mind telling all, me? I, all kinds of stuff. Like, how the latest thing I downloaded was Jack of Astorius, a great bass player who passed away way too soon. Um, the second last thing I put down was Tommy Dorsey, amazing trombone, jazz trombonist that actually taught Frank Sinatra how to sing. How about it? Um, yeah, and then I have uh, Oedipus Lex, I think, uh, recording, I love that piece. Uh, yes, it's really mixed, absolutely very mixed. Oh. Um, so I think that's incredibly important. I mean, we have all kinds of genres that we're playing, and you should uh, you know, find out what the other guys are doing, for sure. Yeah, definitely, you know, just not stay in our little case, right? Yeah, so... No. Yeah, so talking about um, uh, the, the arts and the orchestras, you know, there's so many budget cuts. Do you think there's an alternative career path outside the orchestra path? What do you think? Yeah, so as a bassoonist, uh, being an orchestra musician is, is very rewarding because yeah, we have we have a lot of repertoire uh, as kind of our era, but of course there's teaching, there's, uh, there's education, there's all, of course there's sound, there's tables, all kinds of things, I think, but especially purely solistically, of course we have a certain amount of repertoire, um, but I mean, I find it very, very brave to, to go full out with the soloistic stuff, it's not really my personal cup of tea, I'm definitely more of an orchestral bassoonist and a, a teacher in that sense. Uh, but I have to say, I, I enjoy it immensely that some of my students, like Sebastian, are now pursuing much more soloistic career and this is playing a lot of very important uh, pieces, but also having written pieces written specifically for them and for our instruments. But there's definitely more things to do than orchestra. But um, I have been a very A4 standard, uh, typical orchestral uh, bassoonist all my life. Uh, so that's, that's for me, that's how I sort of define my existence, but uh, there is many, many, many other ways to do it that incorporates the suit for sure. Yeah, I mean, um, as a student, did you, were you practicing like six to eight hours or how were you like as a student? We know so much about you as a, as a pedagogue, as a professor, but do you mind yeah. telling us about your student days? Yeah. Yeah, I was, uh, yeah, I was definitely more in the six to eight hours uh, a day. But I wouldn't call it studying because I really didn't know what I was doing. So I mean, I was, I think I played a lot, but I didn't really study. Um, okay. And I didn't really know uh, what, for what, but uh, yeah, I just had a, you know, an incredible appetite for, for playing, you know, having fun with this. And I, I was very fortunate. I had very structured teachers um, from the beginning. Robert Rodnes was the Stavanger, and he was very serious, which was a very good thing when you're you know, blonde, a Norwegian boy uh, with all kinds of other interests also. So I mean, the, the soup stuff was very serious with him, but I managed to sort of stay on track a little bit. But I wasted a lot of time. Um, and that's also maybe, maybe also one reason why this exercise and drills and all this stuff came as a necessity later, because I actually wanted to structure my own practice. So, uh, so there were, I had some years in Norway, and then I started in Geneva with Roger, which was super, um, especially from an orchestral point of view, because he had this amazing experience from LSO with all the big famous conductors. And he also, it's also an important point, was willing to share the most intimate uh, conversations or, or critique or, or points from these amazing conductors to him as a principal of the LSO. Um, and this was so intimate to, to know these details. What, you know, very Stein said, what, what Karia said, what Boulez and Navarro, all these amazing guys that we have, you know, CDs and records from our MP3, so God knows what, but you know, you know what I mean? These are amazing persons that said very specific things about certain solos. He was there, he played them, and he shared them. So that kind of, I would really call that some kind of Jedi legacy that he really passed that knowledge on, and I cherish that information this day, and I mean, the way I play certain orchestral excerpts are so influenced from 
Roger's teaching and Roger's ideas, which was also then influenced from these great conductors. So that time in Geneva was very reward rewarding. And then I, I got a place in Hannover with Dai Yes. It was very nice to, uh, of course, get a place there. I never seen so many students in our audition before. We were like 30 to 5, <laughs> and I had to warm up in the bathroom, I remember, which was uh, very, uh, quite a thing. But I got the spot and I started working with Dan. I was very, he was relatively new as a professor then. Um, and it was a great time. It was amazing the students. Then there was a lot to learn, of course. And it was also a very clear um, path to the German market and German style of the student playing, I would say. But at that time, I already had a job in Malaysia. I went there, so I was going back and forth. Not ideal for studies. Got a lot of air miles. Uh, but um, I needed the experience also in Malaysia. It was very nice. Um, and after Malaysia, I went to the Danish radio as principal. Uh, which was a great Scandinavian orchestra. Uh, learned a lot of repertoire and I had to play a lot of stuff. Um, and it was exciting to be back home in Scandinavia, but it was this great job in Cologne. Dark also said, why don't you try this job at uh, um, And I did. I got the job and I was very surprised. But then there was also a very important point in my life where yeah, I was surrounded by all these great students down in Germany and I thought, good God, uh, what to do. And then I decided, well, I'm not going to try to be anything else that I, that I am. So I'll try and play as 100% Ula as possible. If they like it, that's great. If they don't, well, at least I was myself. And I thought that was a very important step. And then, yeah, that actually worked out. Um, and then I tried to stay more or less on that path a little bit, that you can actually believe uh, in your own thing. It's a good thing. Mm. So staying, staying true to yourself, to who, who you really are, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I say yeah. this to the students. For the, uh, yeah, for the for the auditions. Yeah, but the further you come into the audition, the further you come to the end, the more personal you can allow yourself to be, and uh, you know, show more, because we are looking for the musician behind the instrument. And that's, uh, I think that's a very important thing. I mean, sich zu verstellen, the same job, if you try to be something else that you are, it will go south uh, at some point, I find. Hmm. Oh, that's great, because that's the answer to my next question, which is, how can one stand out uh, in a sea of many fine musicians? I think you just answered it. Do you maintain such a highly motivated and successful bassoon club? Well, um, it's a good question. Uh, well, I, I'm very lucky. There's a lot of very talented people who wants to come and uh, come to study in Mame. And uh, I mean, there are many places where you don't have the chance to, to pick people. I mean, you're happy if a lot of people can just put them soon together and they can study. And it's very different here. And we've been very fortunate with the reputation. I think the students have worked extremely hard. And, there's been a lot of success, and of course, I'm very proud of that. But uh, I think the work that one has done is—I uh, mean, I would you know—it doesn't matter how much how hard I work if the if the students aren't able to to receive it and to, to change and to, to to do these things. So I think we have managed a very high level of fairness in the class because there are there's a lot of people having lessons and coming to master classes. But when it comes down to the audition, it's the points for me and my colleagues that counts. It doesn't matter how many lessons a certain person has had before or anything. It comes down to the audition. And this is very important. We have like applicants from Australia, South Africa, South America that haven't had the chance to maybe come for a lesson before a master class even. It's about the audition and everybody should have a fair chance for this. So I think it's a very fair setup in that way. I think the ones that come to study in Manheim, they understand this is a class where we work very hard and I expect also a very high output uh, from the students and I have to say if things aren't working out I have asked students to leave actually there's been a few cases um, because not only because of the students but because there are also people waiting and that really wants to to do this kind of work um, yeah and then sometimes one actually has to to say that's not going to work out which is a horrible thing to do for a teacher, but um, 
yeah, that's part of it too. Uh, you have to be a teacher in good and bad days. And uh, you can be proud of your students when things are going uh, really well, but you have to be equally proud as a teacher and as a human being to help them out and put them on their feet again if they fell down. It's mm -hmm. part of my job too. Yeah, I think you're particularly um, talented in um, giving analogies, you know, like to give feedback. Yeah, I think uh, you give feedback in a very um, accessible manner that the student does not feel offended or too hurt, right, in that moment, right? And yeah, they get Maybe that's a bit of a Scandinavian yeah. approach, yeah. We, uh, Scandinavians are generally relative to life, but that many um, I think it's very, very important for me as a teacher, if the teacher points out a wound or actually slices something open and says, this you really can't do, it's very, very important to also provide the remedy and provide the, the antibiotics or the, the band-aid and saying, don't worry, okay, you have a wound there, that hurts, but take this, practice like this and do this and then things will be better. And for me, there's always a very, very strong ethic in moving a student, any student from A to B, no matter how far A is from B, but every lesson has to move in some direction. And I want every student to come out of a lesson feeling, okay, I've moved a certain direction. And I think that's very psychologically very, very important. Hmm. So it comes from the Scandinavian uh, culture and Equality, no? I think that's it, right? A little bit, yeah. But I mean, I have yeah. to say, I do, I, I do enjoy the, the German directiveness, and then we're actually allowed to say in German, no, do it like this, which you don't say in Scandinavia. So, I mean, the, I think the, the efficiency of the German language and the efficiency of the respect one has for arts in general in this country, and that we have 20 or 22 Hochschulen where you can study in the Sud in this country, which is absolutely incredible. Um, that there is such a variety and we are actually, we have something to say, we are supported in what we do, we have great equipment, we have, you know, like I told you, we, in London we have four culture pursuits, uh, we have, you know, quadruple rhythm machines and several cool. instruments that people can have, several instruments that people can have for rental instruments or for trials. It's an absolutely amazing thing to have. So, we are, we are extremely fortunate as German professors in this sense. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, talking about live concerts, has there been a very unusual gig you have ever played in or in a very uh, exotic uh, location or was it like, have you ever had a bad gig in your life before? Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, I know exactly one. Oh, I, was, I was called up once when I was a student in Norway. And uh, this guy asked if I played the bass bassoon. And I said, do you mean the contra bassoon? He said, yeah, I guess so. And I said, yeah, well, uh, I was kind of short of money. So I said, yes, even though I really didn't have a driver's license for the contra at all. But I mean, how hard can it be? I thought, I mean, there was a contra in school and I will find like a fingering chart. And, yeah. and he said, yeah, this is like, it's a children's concert gig, it's no big deal. So can you come and you get this kind of money? So then I said, great, that sounds like an easy gig. So I packed up this country pursuit, I found a fingering chart and I tried my best to sort of, you know, noodle through whatever things there was that was, was a, yeah, it wasn't easy. But I came to this gig um, and this guy said, your costume is over in the corner. And I said, costume? And uh, yeah, I had to dress up like a troll with a, with a tail and everything. And it was like a troll concert for kids and everything and uh, well the NSA so when is our rehearsal we would just have a sound check and then the kids are coming in half an hour and I said well I need the music and I said oh uh, yeah but it's just chords so um, basically they gave me like the guitar chords and stuff like that and yeah I, mean, I have some basic uh, you know theory training for music so I, I could get by a little bit but these were you know serious stuff yeah so I think they basically wanted me to play the bass for the whole thing uh, on the contrabass soon, you know, reading these kind of guitar charts and dressed as a troll. So that was, uh, yeah, and the kids just, you know, kept swarming in and then uh, we had to play this concert and I have to admit I was pretty nervous, pretty nervous. And uh, in the middle of the concert, I thought I did quite well and at some point this guy just turns around and screams at me, solo. So not a <laughs> 
not only do I have to play the bass, now I have to improvise as well. And I mean, I was so lost on this contra and in the guitar charts and, you know, tried to make some kind of thing out of that. And uh, yeah, I somehow got by uh, and the concert was over and then the guy said, he said, you really can't. <laughs> so uh, he said, he would, I'll never ask you again. And, yeah, I, I mean, I don't think I've been that degraded ever but I mean so basically I looked like a troll I was carrying this hello 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 I think I lost you there can you hear me now sorry I, uh, I, I lost, lost I, that I, I, yeah I lost you for a bit yeah Sorry, sorry. So you got the end of the story with uh, <laughs> my horrible troll. Uh, the part when you were in the costume and then, is there an ending? Uh, no, just walking home dressed as a troll with a contrabassoon feeling absolutely degraded that bad. I couldn't do anything. <laughs> walking home dressed as a troll with a contrabassoon feeling absolutely degraded that bad. I couldn't do anything. <laughs> well, how, how old and are you? I know. And I was about, I was 17, I think. I didn't even have to pay off the bus. I think the guy thought I was a draft or somebody who slept outside or something. It was so embarrassing. But uh, yeah, it taught me a lesson. Don't say yes to a gig you can't do. Uh, so then, you know, it's important. Yeah, yeah. But thanks for sharing that anecdote. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time. <laughs> yeah, sure. and your and your insight, I, I, I hope that I'll pass cross again, you know, in the near future. Yeah. I hope so too. Yeah, thank you, Olaf. Yeah. Big pleasure, Joanne. Okay, so good night for Bali. I will end the recording. Enjoy the fancy drinks under the waves, Joanne. All the All best. Right. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.